it's actually quite remarkable to sort of see see this in operation. Um, I'm amazed at, at what uh, the student teams have done. They said that they're basically ready, and uh, we're excited to see how it goes. the team with the highest score, uh, the sum of all of the other categories, and that, that's Delft. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you all for coming to the Delft Hyperloop final design presentation. My name is Edward Schneiders, and I am the team leader of Delft Hyperloop. And talking with me tonight will be my technical manager, Marit Hoek, and our chief technical engineer, Vlad Petrascu. So as I understand now, uh, if I understand correctly, I believe we're live. So this is also being broadcasted all around the world. <laughs> a few years ago, quite some time ago, I went to the most amazing restaurant in Paris. And not too long ago, I was with some friends in Amsterdam, and we were looking for a place to eat. And while we were contemplating some options, that restaurant came back to my mind, and I told them, we should go there. Well, of course, they laughed at me, and we ended up eating somewhere else. But it got me thinking, how great would it be if going to Paris was just like going somewhere else in Amsterdam? If, as it were, if we could bring Paris to our backyard. Just think about it. I could have gone to my restaurant that evening. I could watch how the two Local football teams, Ajax and Paris Saint-Germain, fight it out in the weekends. I could even live in Amsterdam and work in Paris if I wanted to. This got me thinking, maybe Paris is much more in our backyards than we actually imagine. So I went to Google Maps because I wanted to find out how long today it takes us to get to Paris. And so I was at Amsterdam at the time. And I found out quite quickly that traveling from Amsterdam to Paris today will take you one hour and 15 minutes. Not bad. But in reality, this trip, given transit, taxiing, and boarding times, will probably take you between three to three and a half hours. And that's too much. That's not cutting it for an evening out in Paris. So what about the train? The train stations in Amsterdam and the train station in Paris are much closer to the center. This is true, but still this journey will take three hours and 18 minutes. Probably a much less stressful journey, as you won't have taxiing, boarding, and transit times. But still, not cutting it. Too long. However, this is really not all that bad, given that this same journey will take you six hours and three minutes by car. Uh, if you're willing to walk it, 99 hours. And if you're crazy enough and brave enough to brave the open waters, 3,760 hours by canoe. <laughs> so we see that three hours really isn't that bad. But still, we don't see people living in Amsterdam and working in Paris. It's just not worth it. People want to go home to their children, to their families. They don't, they don't have time for themselves. They don't want to spend six hours a day traveling back and forth. And so you see, this, this prospect of having Amsterdam in our backyard, it's just too ambitious. It's not going to happen. Maybe one day when some crazy students come up with some fantastic idea, we might have something like this, but probably not for another 100 years. No, ladies and gentlemen, tonight, obviously, I've come to bring to you that solution that will bring Paris to your backyards, and that is the Hyperloop. So what is the Hyperloop exactly? The Hyperloop is a new, futuristic type of train-like concept which makes use of vacuum tubes and vacuum pumps 
which pumped down the air density inside the tube to 0.1% of outside air density. Now, why we want to do this, I'll explain in just a second. It then makes use of electro motors. Now, these motors are extremely efficient, up to 90%, which means that 90% of the energy you put into your motor can actually become speed. And as these motors permit regenerative braking, which basically means you can get the energy back when you brake, you can actually get 90% of your speed and put it back into energy at the end of your trip, which makes this kind of motor absolutely ideal for high-speed transportation like the Hyperloop. And all of this makes it possible to travel from Amsterdam to Paris in just 30 minutes. Now, why do we want to remove that air in the first place? Well, modern transportation systems today are all limited in their top speed by air resistance. And so removing that air allows you to go much, much faster. 1,000 kilometers per hour in this case. Almost just as importantly, removing that air also makes you much, much more efficient. Despite, despite being faster than any conventional modern transportation concept, Hyperloop is actually also much more efficient. Four times more efficient per kilometer per passenger than the airplane, and three and a half times more efficient than the, plane, than the train. But why do we want this? Why do we need a faster and more efficient transportation concept like the Hyperloop? Can we be happy with what we already have? Let me give you a few reasons. The first of which is that modern day transportation concepts cannot cope with modern day transportation needs. And this leads to soul crushing congestion. Hyperloop combines the convenience of a train with the speed of an airplane, and therefore creates much shorter, much more efficient, and much more congested, less congested commuting times. With this, we hope to increase the quality of life of the individual, and therefore create progress in society. Let me give you another reason. Today's high-speed transportation systems are all far too energy inefficient. We are finally waking up to the consequences of fossil fuels. And as Delft Hyperloop, we don't only want to create progress for this generation, but also for future generations. And that is why we want to create a transportation system that is clean and energy efficient for future generations to come. And the third sort of hidden reason is the fact that being in a closed system, being in a tube, Hyperloop is less prone to external influences. So if you were to look at all these transportation systems, or modern transportation systems, on a scale of efficiency to speed, you would see that the airplane is extremely fast, but it's not all that efficient. The train, on the other hand, is more efficient, but it's not quite as fast. The car is both less fast, and less efficient. You could walk it, be extremely efficient, but that's extremely slow. And if you're completely crazy, you could canoe everything, but we both know that's extremely energy inefficient and extremely slow. But what do we see that's missing here on this table? The top right corner, we don't see anything. And so apparently it's impossible to create a transportation system that's both extremely efficient and extremely fast. But no, that's not true, because that's exactly what the Hyperloop is. So where can we expect to see Hyperloops in the future? Well, at Delft Hyperloop, we are currently working out the details of a track Amsterdam to Paris, all the way from its station down to its foundations. In fact, we're even looking at the triangle connection Amsterdam, Paris, Frankfurt. However, given its clear benefits, we expect to see Hyperloops all over Europe one day, given that uh, once it's proven its commercial viability. In fact, at Delft Hyperloop, we think that Europe will one day be seen much less as a continent, but much more as a city, connected by different metro-like Hyperloop stops. And that's amazing. 
That's what we call progress at Delft Hyperloop. But so now comes the million dollar question. The question that determines that this is not just some really well thought up of excuse for us to skip lectures for a year and play with expensive toys. And that is, is it possible? When can we expect to see a Hyperloop? Well, the technology behind Hyperloop isn't revolutionary. In fact, for 21st century terms, it's ages old. Hyperloop basically combines the pressure vessel of an airplane and puts it on top of the technology of a high-speed Shanghai train. Both of these technologies have been around since the 1970s, tested and proven. Add this to vacuum tubes and vacuum pumps, which have been around for much longer, and you have a Hyperloop. However, being an infrastructure project, and therefore being a very large investment, you want to work out all the fine details before you can actually put a Hyperloop down. And that is why in 2013, this man, Mr. Elon Musk, CEO of SpaceX, Tesla, Solar City, you name it, introduced his original Hyperloop Alpha concept. But in 2014, he said that instead of doing it himself, that he would let the students figure this one out. And he introduced the SpaceX Hyperloop Pod Competition, an international student competition in which student teams from some of the best universities all over the world come together and compete in order to forward the Hyperloop concept. In the first competition, there were many criteria. But this year, there's only one. And that is the fastest vehicle wins. In Delft at the Dream Hall, where DREAM stands for Dream Realization of Extremely Advanced Machines, something that I find quite beautiful. This is a place in Delft where students come together and form student teams in order to compete in international student competitions. And so in 2014, obviously, the founders of our team jumped at the opportunity to compete and join this competition. And this year, I'm extremely proud to announce to you the new Delft Hyperloop Dream Team. 37 of the TU Delft's very best, 27 of which are full-time, meaning they have stopped their studies for an entire year in order to forward the Hyperloop concept and make as large of an impact as they can on the future of transportation. So please, a very warm applause for the new Delft Hyperloop Dream Team. So as I mentioned earlier, this year the competition is all about speed. And the current Hyperloop speed world record is held by a startup, Hyperloop One, at 384 kilometers per hour. This summer, we aim to break Hyperloop One's record and achieve the new Hyperloop speed world record. So now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you're all starting to feel that it's almost time for us to unveil our new design. But first, I'd like to ask you if you can remember the short video that I showed you at the start of this presentation. Now, why did I want to show you this video? Well, if you paid attention closely, you would have seen that this is footage of last year's team winning last year's competition. This is important as it shows the standard, the minimum by which this year's team evaluated their own design and what a standard it was. But in order to progress, we had to do our best, fight even to do better, because that is progress. It's not been easy. There have been times of stress, joy, actual blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> Pushing the boundaries of modern technology, and even ourselves, sometimes to the point of breaking. 
but I am proud to show to you its result. And that is our new design, Atlas. Wait a minute, not so fast. So, sorry for the cliffhanger, but first I want to uh, introduce you to the process to get here and to good get there in California. I am Maurits Hoek, the technical manager of this project, and yeah, I will tell you something about the process from the beginning of our year in September until that final date, the 22nd of July, where our entire project comes together. An American TV channel said once that if there were to be an Olympics for engineering, it would be Elon Musk's Hyperloop boat competition. And in fact, and, uh, athletes train a whole year long, they sacrifice their life to go for that one gold medal in Pyeongchang. And we, engineers, also work a whole year long for that one goal, and that's winning with a world record, that Hyperloop boat competition in California. And all our year, the work we do the entire year, comes down in that single run there in California. There's no room for error, and everything needs to be perfect. And well, we do something new. We do something new for ourselves, but also something new for the world. And that means that we have many uncertainties in our project. At some points, we don't even know if it's possible what we want. And we, come part, we have parts, and we don't even know if they exist in the world. And with, where, with our entrepreneurship and with our courage, we take on these challenges and we actually move the boundaries of engineering and explore new ways to engineering to fix this. And yeah, we want to build a revolutionary vehicle and we want to do that from scratch in one year. How on earth do we do that? Ah. Actually, how on earth? Yeah, we have from 11 different countries, from all five continents, even someone from Chile. We have engineers, and we gather them here in Delft. And they have different backgrounds, different cultures, different way to work together, different characters. And we have engineers from all different faculties within the TU Delft. We have applied physicists, mechanical engineers, computer science students, electronic engineers, and we all bring them together in our workshop, our HQ, in the north of the campus, at the north of the campus, an old chemical engineering building, and this is where the magic happens. Divided into 10 different subsystems, 10 vital functions for our team to be a success and to win that competition, every engineer has become an expert in that field, in one of those 10 main functions. And if we would have an Olympic team uh, like this, then we would have in the attack our powertrain and drivetrain departments, making sure that we can accelerate as fast as possible through the tube. And on the other side, we would have as, as goalkeepers our braking guys, making sure that our pod stops as quick as possible at the end of our run. And keeping all this together, oh, keeping all this, this together, are the suspension, navigation and control and structures people. They make sure that during our run, during that huge acceleration and during that huge deceleration, our pod stays on track, stays controlled, and most importantly, stays together and doesn't fall apart. And in the back, we have our backbone of our team, the management and business, business departments, delivering the framework for us to work in, facilitating the framework for us to work in. And finally, on the flanks, we have the full Hyperloop and passenger module departments taking care of the scalability and the scalability towards the future of our project. And once again, everyone in this team has become, in the past few months, a crucial engineer we can't miss for one, our single goal, and that's winning the competition. This is the team with who we have to do it. And that's, if you imagine it, an incredible once-in-a-lifetime in a opportunity. It's, it's amazing to see that with 37 students, we sit together 
and most of us are full time. We stop a year of our studies at the, at the peak of our lives, an average age of 23. <laughs> and, and, we, and, we, and we work on this project. And we see all this, this passion, enthusiasm, all these skills, and also enthusiasm of you guys in, in, the, in the room. It's amazing to see how big that line in front of, our, our, of this theater was. And all that enthusiasm combined in this team, that's what makes it so, so special to work in, in this team, to be part of this team. And yeah, also if we take 37 students in one room, very ambitious, very smart, very motivated. Ah, that's, that's quite challenging. So, so, so one of the first things you need to do is you need to find the right balance. You need to find the right recipe to work. And as we only have one year to achieve this, we need to find the right balance between quality, time, team relationships, individual well-being, and finance. And with the, other, the one parameter, you could buy the other one. For example, with finance, you can, could buy time. So it's always the trick to find the balance and have exactly the right amount of every parameter in order to get success and to get the most out of ourselves. But yeah, no matter how much we work, no matter how good our team is, and no matter how good our balance is, Balance, our balance is, it only works with the right decisions and the right ideas and the right concepts in the beginning. So that's why you can see here, as here working one of the first few weeks, and that's why uh, right here we, we re researched basically every option, every concept that could make us win. We researched crazy concepts with rockets, and probably we're gonna have a rocket, by the way, but that's still secret. Uh, <laughs> we, yeah, we combined different, different concepts, and we did this for two months long, and we, we consulted many experts. Some of you are also in the room. And at the end, we could say, somewhere in October, that we ha were pretty confident that we had a really, really good concept, and that we are good on track. So the next step for an athlete would be Training your technique, working on technique, get better, get better, get better. And for us, that means making difficult models. You could, you could see them having many difficulties right here on the, on the computer. As making simulations, drawings, rapid prototyping for the electronics guys and girls. This is a girl. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think... I, I, <laughs> And yeah, in the, in the end, in the end, we have 50,000 hours of work, of work on our design, and three months from a very young and broad concept, we narrowed, narrowed it down, and within three months, 50,000 hours of work, 37 people, into a detailed design, a detailed design designed until the smallest washer bought a nut, from the lines, from the wires on the PCB to the last lines of code in our software. And we have over 1,600 parts coming from all over the world together here in Delft. Here in Delft, we're deep in the night. If everyone, and most of you also in this room, is already sleeping soundly in their beds, but we are still inside where the Olympic flame of the TU Delft <laughs> is still alight. <laughs> and inside, we are putting, we, we, we are on the point of finishing our 600 pages design package that we want to send to SpaceX in order to convince them that we can run in the tube. And I, took this was a ni I thought this was a nice picture to illustrate that. You see many people behind one desktop on the, that crucial moment on, way, on which everything comes together. But yeah, when I looked closer to this, this picture, you could see in the left down corner, you can see Edouard, who just, who just spoke, taking a quick power nap <laughs> in order to be fully energized again. And uh, yeah, because this was a really, really cru crucial moment in our project. Many teams over the world are, 
are interested in this, in this competition. The interest is high. Over the, be the best universities around the world apply for this competition. And SpaceX only selects a few of those teams to run in their tube. In the end, only three teams can run in the tube. So the, the, the competition is really, really high. But yeah, I think this, this, this picture already good, tells good news. On the, on the 1st of February, we got a notification from SpaceX that we are actually qualified for that Olympics of Engineering. With the entire team, we will go there to SpaceX and set that world record. And yeah, what would the next step for an athlete be? Uh, that is making insane training hours, training, training, training. And for us, that means production. And the beauty is, most of our pot, we produce it ourselves, in-house. And that means that five people of us are full-time working and milling and lating at the Dremo, uh, back in the campus, every day from I believe three in the morning sometimes uh, until until late, and 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 they they make all our metal parts. But more extremely, so here you see the milling and lading. But more extremely, eight people of us moved somewhere to a remote place, somewhere yeah, yeah in a remote place of the Netherlands, and they live there for two months. They live there for two months, and the only thing they do is from seven to seven. They work on our carbon fiber layup. So that's, that's already one reveal of our design. We have a carbon layer. Um, yeah, and in two months, we will already have a pot. We will already have a design realized in real life. And in May, we are ready for our last final checks. Everything needs to be ready for that single competition in SpaceX. And that means that we literally test everything. So in vacuum chamber, we will test our pod in a vacuum chamber in which they normally test satellites that go into space. And our pod needs to be space graded. Our pod need, just needs to be space graded. And why is that? Of course, because we go to Elon Musk, to SpaceX. And right in front of his rocket factory, he built a single tube, the first Hyperloop tube ever. Half scale, 1.2 kilometers long, one of the biggest vacuum chambers in, in the world. And inside this tube, it all has to happen. Inside this tube, the work, our entire year of work will come together in that 15 second run, in that 15 second run where we want to set, set that world record. The entire year of work comes down in that 15 second run and that 15 second run will actually be a leap into the future. Everything comes together here. We had the car. We had the train. We had the boat. We had the airplane. And now together, together we, we, we witness and we take that step to the fifth mode of transportation. The fifth mode of transportation is here, the Hyperloop.
five months of working on this vehicle and I'm still speechless when I look at it. My name is Vlad Petrescu. I'm the chief engineer of this Hyperloop project. And I'm here today to talk to you about two major aspects of our Hyperloop design. The experience of the passengers, such as the interior design and the modularity aspects of it, as well as the performance of the launcher that you just saw before. But first, it's about you, about the future passengers of Hyperloop, because hopefully one day you'll get the chance to get on board one of those. Well, in case you do, it will look something like this. An interior luxurious environment, something similar to a business jet cabin, that is able to maintain a constant ambient pressure inside the shell. And the best way to do that is to have a cylindrical shape that is also used in submarines or in aircraft, because this helps the pressure to distribute uniformly around the skin, around the structure. But first I want to focus on the passenger module design. And the best thing about it is the floor plan. Because for every six passengers, there's only one door needed, which is the best compromise between having on one hand a lightweight structure and on the other hand making it easy for the passengers to embark and disembark. But how do we get you from Amsterdam to Paris? We need a launcher for that. You could choose to embark every 30 seconds and go towards your destination using an economy class. Or you could choose a more spacious environment, the first class, if you'd like to. But nonetheless, during the night, during the off-peak hours, the pod will be busy transporting, transporting cargo from one place to another. Like literally any type of cargo from fresh foods to sensitive payload flying to the outer space. <laughs> but the point is, Hyperloop is modular in our vision. The vehicle that you see here in this picture will not race at the SpaceX competition. It will be only the launcher, the racing mode, that will experience this wonderful ride. And we do that because you can imagine that every time when you want to try, when you tr try to, make, to break a speed record, you don't want to have any payloads carrying with you. So from this point on, I'll focus on the launcher, on the performance aspect of our vehicle. Over time, people have developed different types of machines, different types of means of transportation, such as the car or the, the airplane. But unfortunately, they are coming closer and closer to their design limits. And that is because they are constantly trying to push all this air in front of them when they are accelerating. And that's where the Hyperloop takes advantage of the situation. Its output power, it's much higher. And that's because there's no aerodynamic drag. And the, because of the technological advancements, the, the weight can be much lower. And thus, the power to weight ratio can be much higher. So let's see how our pods will do in a race. Let's race against the Boeing 737 and the Toyota Press. <laughs> we did pretty well, right? <laughs> the reason why we accelerate so fast, it's because of what I showed you before. It's all about the power to weight ratio. And our pod is not only energy efficient, but it has a huge amount of power on board. So much power that it can light up an entire neighborhood of Delft for a, for a few seconds. And all this energy is stored into tiny little cells, similar to the ones you have in your phones, 800 of them, in order to provide the power we need to accelerate. But these cells don't like vacuum, so we need a case around them to protect them for the, from this harsh environment. We accelerate using an electric motor. And by means of a drivetrain system, very simple but very efficient, we are transferring all this force to the track. And for cars, this is actually the limiting factor, the tire itself. 
That's why you often see on the racing cars these huge wings attached on them. It's because they provide downforce in order to have more grip and accelerate even faster. Well, we can't do that, right? Because the entire reason of, the, the entire idea of Hyperloop is to have no air inside these tubes. So we came up with something different. We said, why not using something that SpaceX already provides? Why not using the I-beam, the track itself, to clamp on it and have the amount of grip that we need in order to accelerate very fast? But unfortunately, this I-beam is not ideal. You can imagine that every time you have these huge I-beam segments and you want to join them together to form a track, these joints cannot be perfect. So that's why we need a suspension. We need something to make sure our vehicle is centered around, around the I-beam. We need something that constrains the five degrees of motion. One of them, for instance, being the pitch movement. So as some of you might know, the wheelie aspect. And uh, this usually happens during acceleration, but it can also happen during braking. We actually brake harder than we accelerate. We brake so hard that we can't store all this energy on board. Well, we could, but it wouldn't actually make any sense. This is a Ferrari braking roughly six times slower than what we're planning to build. And as you can see, the discs glow up quite rapidly. And at those temperatures, the pads are not very efficient anymore. So that's why we are again using the I-beam to brake on and bring the pod to a standstill. This is how it would look like. A fail-safe braking system that is able to bring the pod to a standstill, even when experiencing a power loss. But in order to brake exactly at the point where we reach the top speed, which, by the way, I can't tell you tonight, it will remain classified, we need a very accurate navigation system to tell us at any given point in time what is the, what is the velocity and the position of the pod inside the tube. To conclude, all these subsystems are assembled into a seamless, high-power density vehicle. And it, is, and it is the chassis' main function to make sure all these subsystems are supported by it and don't, they won't fall apart. The chassis is made out of the sandwich, sandwich panel configuration, having carbon fiber on the exterior and honeycomb at the core. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Atlas. This is our design. It really is a thing of beauty. So now, ladies and gentlemen, if I could ask just one more special moment of attention for all of those who have made all of this possible. They provide us with knowledge, cutting edge materials and facilities, and even finances. They have brought us this far, and I'm confident that this summer, they will bring us across the finish line so please, a very special thank you and a very, very warm applause for our 52 amazing sponsors. Yeah. I really would like to say a special thank you to these sponsors because without them, we really can't do anything. But together, we can help bring Paris closer to you, to your backyards. And so please, next time, save yourself some time and some energy, and just take a canoe with you onto your Hyperloop. <laughs> so I'd now like to invite the team on stage for a team picture and a warm applause.
I'd like to invite everybody to the foyer for a drink and any questions you may have for us. Thank you all for coming and thank you for your attention.